The music in today's video was created by two very talented musicians, Michael Paul and Christopher Zudem, two of the composers of an amazing soundtrack in a mobile game called Beast Brawl. If you want to check out their other work, I've put some links in the description, including the Beast Brawl original soundtrack. Today's story was written by Reddit user Glacial Fury. A secret research facility, an ancient artifact. How could Josh Taggart have known what awaited him in the lab that night? Ten minutes before the event. Thunder rumbled in the skies overhead the Genesis research complex, muffled and distant, but the two scientists, standing around a small engineer's table inside one of the complex's many research labs, took no notice. This is the best preserved Centurion's helmet I've ever seen. Antiquities research director Josh Taggart stood in the formerly abandoned lab for the arcane and the occult and marveled at the ancient helmet's immaculate condition. Where did you say you found it? Dr. Wesley Strayham straightened from adjusting one of the many sensor lines running from the helmet to a myriad of instruments and scanners blinking and whirring along the lab's walls and benches. New excavation site in Scotland, he said, lifting a finger gloved in latex blue to push his little round spectacles back up the bridge of his nose. Recently discovered while I was on holiday five miles north of Hadrian's Wall, near a collection of hills and thickets belonging to the Greater Caledonian Forest. An amazing piece! Josh whistled low through his teeth and walked a slow circle around the helmet, admiring its gleaming steel and brass embossing, and especially the transverse crest of red plumes that had somehow miraculously survived untold centuries buried in the earth. How is it so well preserved? He glanced up at Wesley. I've seen no trace of the typical damage present on similar artifacts I've unearthed over the years. If I didn't know better, I'd think its owner had just finished polishing it with oil before bedding down for the night. Something in the soil? He made as if to touch a small lightning bolt etched into the helmet just below the crest. But Wesley's strangled hiss cut him short. Nut! Wesley cried out and jerked up a hand. Don't touch the leads. Don't touch anything. Those are highly sensitive, precision instruments. Static electricity, body oils, and even the faintest bit of moisture from a fingertip could throw off my calibrations to disastrous effect. It took me five hours to get everything adjusted and into proper order. I don't need you tossing it up for me at the last minute. Okay, take it easy. Josh made placating gestures with his hands and took care not to disturb the dozens of cables and wires snaking from the helmet like a prop from some bad sci-fi movie. He glanced around at the shelves and cases of beakers and glass tubes, old antiquated scanning devices and computers cluttering the little dungeon-like lab and all showing an impressive layer of dust. I can't mess things up any more than the neglect I see on every inch of this place. He flashed a grin. Well, not much more anyway. Whatever. Just don't touch anything. Phase one is almost ready. Josh shrugged at his friend's surly mood and continued to study the lab. Phase one? Is that what this is? Why are we down in this forgotten crypt of a workshop rather than your quantum physics lab? He scrubbed the back of his wrist across his forehead and glanced at an overhead air vent all choked with dust. Does the air work down here? Who'd you piss off? Ah, Wesley tapped his temple with a finger. But you answered your own question. Forgotten. That is the key, my friend. Privacy. Everything else I'll explain in due time. My calculations. My discovery. Have patience. Josh felt a gentle humour at his friend's attempt at mystery. You already ran metallography and EDS dating? Of course, Wesley said never looking up from his work, but his tone sounded slightly amused. It said that Josh was asking silly questions, and radiocarbon on the feathers and all the other scans and tests we normally run to verify authenticity. Wesley straightened, brushed back a lock of raven hair that had spilled over his glasses, and looked Josh straight in the eyes. This is not my primary field, true, but I have taken care to consider every possibility taken every precaution. 
I snuck all the equipment I would need for my experiments down here over the last few weeks. One piece at a time. I don't need those nosy hacks I work with snooping about my research. They wouldn't understand the subtleties anyway. Experiments? Josh couldn't help but wonder. What could Wesley hope to glean from a centurion's helmet beyond the obvious? He puzzled on that for a moment. Perhaps some obscure metalworking theory, or an advanced study of the helmet's heritage and lineage? Of what interest could such things hold to a quantum physicist? Josh shrugged and set his questions aside for the moment. So this is the real deal, he said. Not some elaborate reproduction? I don't see how that's possible. It's in pristine condition. Astounding. He studied the helmet with a critical eye. It rested on what looked to be a mannequin's head on an engineer's table. But he knew when it came to Wesley, it was so much more. Small sensor pads and emitters, micro circuits and glowing diodes covered what would be the dummy scalp. This was not standard equipment. It was a creation of Wesley's devising for which Josh couldn't begin to guess the purpose, but found himself intrigued despite a long day of fruitless meetings and the approaching midnight hour. So what exactly are you doing here with all this? He gestured around at the wires and equipment. Why have you dragged me out here on Halloween when I should be home watching ghost stories with my kids? You know they don't get to stay up late very often, so I'm blaming Uncle Wes for this, right? Wesley glanced up and gave him a pinched look from across the helmet. I'll make it up to them, won't I? His voice dropped to a mutter before picking up again. If my theories prove true, their father will be here to witness history. Nay, he will be a part of history. Fancy a Nobel, do you? This is our chance. Zero point energy will seem like steam power by comparison. When the world looks back on this day, they will say that it was here in this lab at this moment that history was rewritten. History rewritten? Josh couldn't help but scoff at such a bold claim, even from someone as brilliant as Wesley. Was his friend serious? What could he have discovered in an old Roman helmet that could change history? What are you talking about? Wesley inhaled deeply and assumed the look and manner of a teacher about to lecture a challenging student. Something unusual preserved this helmet through the ages. We can both agree on that, yes? Yes, it's truly remarkable. I would like to study... Yes, yes, Wesley flipped his hands at Josh impatiently. You will, you will, in time. First, I must prove my theory true. Then you may study it to your heart's content. Josh accepted this with a gracious bow of his head and gestured for Wesley to continue. Please, you were saying? Wesley looked at him. Where was I? Oh yes, the sight. Something drew me there, Josh. Something powerful. I knew there was something different about the grove the moment I set foot on that soil. Could feel it in the air around me, almost a feather-like tickle on my skin, or a hum you can't quite hear. Something took hold of me, a sort of madness you might call it. And I suddenly knew what I had to do. I returned with a prototype scanner of my own design, and that's when I discovered it. An immensely powerful energy field surrounding the area. One I've never encountered before and cannot explain. It permeates the soil, the trees, the very air around the dig site, like some invisible dome. Wesley moved about the lab, making last minute adjustments to his instruments and checking readouts. It's something I don't understand and am loath to mention to you anyone but you for fear they will laugh me into obscurity. Do you know what that means for a researcher of my pedigree? We are men of science after all, not given to chasing childish fancies. I'd be a hack lucky to find work at a colour mixing lab if this got out before I had proof. He stopped then looked at Josh, emotions warred on his face. Uncertainty, fear, excitement. I'm a man of science, like you, and men of science make it our business to puzzle out things we don't understand. He pointed at the engineer's table. Something kept the elements from ravaging this helmet. That is irrefutable, 
But what? Aren't you curious? Doesn't the need to know burn in your blood? Something? Josh lifted a brow. An inside joke for their shared love of a certain television show featuring a scientist of supreme logic. Maybe radiation? No, no, nothing like that. It's something different. Stronger. Stranger. Far more exotic. Wesley's voice dropped to a conspirator whisper, and he said the following two words slowly, with a pronounced pause between. Divine energy. I wrote a paper on it some years ago. Theories on the presence of a divine aura at certain Roman ruins. Do you remember? It's real. I've found it. Such energy as I've never seen before. Do you know what this means? Josh stared at him for a blank second, his mind searching back through the years. Then he grunted a laugh. Divine aura? Come on, Wes, you're a scientist. You work with facts and logic. I'm sure there is a perfectly reasonable explanation for this energy of yours. Something rational, not divine. He studied his friend more closely now, and a twinge of worry stirred within him. Wesley seemed somehow different, almost manic. Wesley adjusted his glasses and blinked. There is something otherworldly at that sight, Josh. I could feel it in my bones. My equipment detected it too. I almost missed it, but it's there. I know it's there. Wesley's fleshy cheeks flushed ruddy under the slightest sheen of sweat, and his eyes were wide and fervent. Like when he got to talking to Josh about his pantheon theories. Science is a tool to prove things exist, to help us understand something previously beyond our comprehension. Agreed? Agreed, Josh said, his voice now guarded. Then it dawned on him what Wesley was doing here. This was a joke, some kind of Halloween prank. For the briefest of moments, he was proud of his perpetually ascetic friend breaking out of his shell. Then his lips pressed into a disapproving line. A few hundred years ago, they believed in petty gods and monsters, Wesley said. Valhalla, Elysium, untold myths and magics, and so much which we now dismiss as fairy tales. Think of the legends of giants and dragons and magical fairies not just from one civilization or culture, but countless across the globe and the ages. Civilizations that never had any contact, yet all telling variations of the same stories. Angels, gods and titans. Different names, but the same deities. Think about it. Yes, Wesley, the ancients were a superstitious lot. Thankfully, we outgrew the ignorance of mysticism and, as men of logic, Understand that any similarities to their stories are merely happenstance. Did we? Happenstance? What if the ancients were right all along? Josh was stunned. Wesley's face showed no sign of humour. What? He managed to say. Wesley couldn't be serious. He looked around for hidden cameras. He knew must be there or any sign that Wesley was pranking him. This is some kind of joke, right? He said, a wave of annoyance casting a shadow over his good humour. Wesley knew he didn't like pranks, not since Tony Ferguson and the goldfish in sixth grade. Why draw this out? Magic, Wesley, you can't be serious. We left such fables behind in boyhood. Higher knowledge through cutting edge research is our pursuit. Not fairy tales concocted 2,000 years ago in primitive minds struggling to understand the mysteries around them. You are a scientist, a man who deals with facts, not fantasy. What's really going on here? Are you alright? Has something happened? You know you can tell me anything. Wesley was shaking his head fervently. His eyes burned with the light of knowing. No, this is not a joke. Listen to me. There's more to this than anyone could possibly know. I feel it, something inexplicable and inexorable, urging me toward the truth, and I mean to prove it's real. Josh took a deep breath. He couldn't believe what he was hearing. How could Wesley, a man of supreme scientific intellect, believe any of this? He knew the old pantheons were a beloved project for Wes, something he'd dabbled with since they were boys. Greek, Viking, Roman, 
especially anything Roman. There was a certain mystery and romance to ancient Roman life. Josh had to admit, the way they lived and their culture, the marvellous feats of art and engineering. But this? Had the years of 90 hour weeks in the lab finally broken Wes? Had this brilliant mind snapped under the pressure? There was no such thing as divine magic. Any person of sufficient modern education understood this. No mystery steeped in ancient gods. This artifact was simply a magnificently preserved helmet, a miracle no doubt, but not at the hands of divine beings. The helmet is unusual, perhaps even unique, I admit, Josh said, but there has to be a rational explanation for how it managed to survive the ages, Wes. There has to be, we just have to find it. Wesley's jaw flared. So you want proof, do you? He dug into his lab coat's pocket, came out with a small cylindrical device no bigger than a fountain pen, and pointed it at the helmet. Light glinted off its metallic skin. Here's your proof. The device beeped and chirped, and a nearby screen filled with scrolling information. There, you see, Wesley cried out. Don't you see it? It's there on the screen. Energy resonance like none ever recorded. The power saturation is tremendous, unbelievably dense. This is the same signature I detected at the site. His voice softened into awe. A piece of the divine aura. It's there, do you see it? The Romans knew, they knew. Jupiter, Mars and the rest. Josh glanced at the screen. The coloured graphs and scrolling formulas meant nothing to him beyond a rudimentary understanding. He wasn't that kind of scientist, but that didn't mean they were not valid. Besides, he'd never seen Wes so worked up over a theory. Was it possible his friend had stumbled onto something truly monumental here, and Josh couldn't see past his own prejudices to the truth? Even so, formulas on a screen were all very well, but Wes would need more to convince the scientific community his theory was fact much more. Josh studied his friend. There was an almost fanatical zeal burning in his eyes as though his mind churned with secrets only he could know. Was this a boyish excitement for a new discovery, or the first flickers of madness pulling him under? I see the numbers, yes, Josh said. But what do they mean? Surely not proof of divine energy? Look, it's just an ancient helmet. A fascinating mystery to be sure, but there's nothing arcane in the metal. Josh decided the best course of action was to calm his friend and suggest they revisit this conversation after a good night's sleep had provided some much needed clarity. Let's call it a night, Wes. We can head to the house. Kiss made calzones for dinner. There's still time to catch a couple of shows with the kids. They would love a visit from their uncle Wes. What do you say? Wesley shook his head and turned away, tapping virtual keys on devices and muttering to himself about Jupiter, the Sky Father, calling to him. When it became clear to Josh that Wes would not budge from this path, he changed tactics. Wesley required something more drastic to snap him out of this bizarre fugue. On impulse, Josh reached for the helmet and, before he had time to think about what he was doing, had the thing on his head. Wise and all, a ripple of cold whispered along his skin at the moment of contact, then it was gone. See, Wes, he said, ignoring the strange sensation and pointing at the helmet with both index fingers and a snarky grin beginning on his face. A small part of him still hoped this was Wesley's misguided attempt at a jape. And if so, meant to turn it around on him. Nothing. No mystical energy or divine magic. No ancient curses from long forgotten gods to strike me down. Nothing. Just the cold touch of metal on my cheeks. The same its owner must have felt all those years ago. Wesley was horror struck. He looked like he was choking on a pickle. No, what have you done? A crash of thunder rocked the labs and the lights flickered. 
Josh took his eyes off Wesley and frowned at the lab door. There were no storms forecast for this evening, and the sky showed nothing but stars and a full moon on his drive here, not a wisp of clouds in sight. Strange. Could it be fireworks? No, that didn't make sense. The Genesis Research Complex was a veritable fortress built in the middle of nowhere for a good reason. The next generation technology developed within these walls was worth billions, perhaps trillions. Thunder crashed again, louder this time, and a sharp pain lanced through his brain. Abruptly, his sight filled with fleeting images of lightning scrawling brilliant, forking cracks across the belly of an endless storm, and there was a strangeness about the vision that went beyond the mundane. Glass beakers rattled on shelves, static rolled across screens, and it seemed the lab grew colder, a whisper of winters across his spine. Something was wrong. He could feel it in the air. The budding smile on his face drained away as the hairs on the back of his neck rose. A third blast shook the tiles under Josh's feet and vibrated in his teeth, and he felt the first faint stirrings of concern twist in his gut. Something was definitely wrong here. Something about that thunder. It was unnatural and unbelievably menacing, like the promise of retribution from a vengeful god. Cold fingers crept up his spine. Divine energy? Wesley's words from earlier whispered in Josh's mind. Could it be true? Thunder roared as if in answer. The helmet. He lifted his hands to yank the thing off, but found he could not move. His body felt frozen in place. What the? Panic flared in his chest. He tried to call out to Wes for help, but could not speak. Frozen, his friend's mouth moved, but gave no sound. There was only the thunder and, in its absence, a shrill keening that filled his ears. The world blurred and refocused, then blurred again and a strange electric tingling crawled over his skin. Again the thunder struck, an explosion of sound so tremendous it seemed the world outside must have fractured, and he might have momentarily lost consciousness. The room dissolved into a field of stars that streaked away toward infinity. There followed a moment of gut-twisting confusion and the indescribable feeling of his mind decoupling from his body a horrifying wrenching, tearing free of the ethereal ties which bound his soul to its corporeal form. For a heartbeat, he floated in the ether, drifting weightless and formless in an endless sea of souls. There was howling and chittering and the terrible wails of the damned, lost in the dark. Then everything faded away and he was falling, falling forever. Consciousness returned to him in a slow drip. When his vision cleared, he saw green, windswept fields bordered in distant thickets stretching before him and soldiers arrayed in overlapping bands of steel armour strapped over red tunics marching in tight ranks all around. They were oddly familiar, these soldiers so alike in their hammered metal caps, like a dream he could almost remember. What? Where am I? What is this place? Where is the lab? Where is Wes? Questions spun through his mind, and no answers. A sensation like water draining from his ears returned his hearing, and he felt his mouth move of its own accord. Felt it form words he didn't understand. His head turned, and he saw row upon row of those same armoured soldiers, carrying rectangular shields, emblazoned with a gold eagle crest on a field of crimson and short, steel-tipped spears glinting with promises of death. There must have been hundreds of them, thousands, arranged in neat blocks of eighty or a hundred. This can't be real. This isn't real. It's a dream. Yes, I'm dreaming. I'm not a soldier. I'm Josh Taggart, a researcher at… at where? The name so firmly fixed in his mind only a moment ago melted away and was gone and he could no longer hold on to his thoughts. I am… he couldn't remember. Fear seized his heart in a fist of dread. But only for the quiet moment that exists between heartbeats. 
Then a feeling of rightness settled over him, like sinking into a warm pool of healing water, and the strange words he'd spoken before were now old friends. He understood them. He knew where they were marching, and why. All his training and years of fighting in the legions, a lifetime of memories, triumphs and tragedies, rose out of the blank numbness that was his subconscious mind, and he somehow knew that this was how it was meant to be. I am. Centurion Decimus Spurus Silvanus shook off a sudden bout of dizziness. For a moment, there were blurred glimpses of a strange chamber with smooth white walls and bizarre coloured lights blinking and swimming in his vision and a voice speaking words he did not know. Then it was gone. Decimus decided it must be from bad food. His contubineum's cook, Lucius Callius, was a good soldier, solid as any legionary in the ninth. But he couldn't fill a cook pot with quality if Mars himself commanded it. The memory of last night's horror still boiled in Decimus's gut. Grumbling under his breath, Decimus aimed a curse at Lucius and decided the dizziness and imagined voice from a moment ago were a symptom of the man's ill-fated attempt at last night's supper. Caledonian Frontier, 128 AD, five miles north of Fortress Vekovikium, Hadrian's Wall. Centurion Decimus Spurius Silvanus watched ravens cycle in the sky from where he marched beside the first centuria of the first cohort of Legio IV, the Ninth Legion. Vile birds, he muttered and spat in the grass, putting his focus back on the enemy ranks spread out in mismatched formations across the distant field. Half a mile, he thought, no more, today we put an end to this rabble. Emperor Hadrian had ordered the Ninth North of the Wall to subdue a barbarian horde rampaging in the area, disrupting cross-border trade and said to be in possession of a lost legion eagle. A most sacred object, whether true or not, the decorated Ninth needed little reason to seek out barbarian armies and destroy them. They welcomed the glory, reveled in the destruction of Rome's enemies. A faint rumble issued from the trees to the west, behind the barbarian army, rolling softly with distance. Decimus frowned up at the sky. Strange. Pale blue stretched from horizon to horizon, and no wind stirred across the land. No scent of rain. Fifteen years of campaigning in the legions, and never had he seen a sky so clear give thunder. The rumble came again and the air suddenly grew cold and biting. Goose flesh rose on his arms. Could this be some sort of pagan witch magic? Today was the festival of Samhain here in barbarian lands, a day where it was whispered the veil between worlds was thin and the dead walking among the living, or so the vile barbarian bone shamans preached. No, the only true gods were Roman gods, piss on the Greeks. To believe otherwise was to spit in Jupiter's eye, and he wouldn't do that for anyone. Jupiter. Decimus glanced at the sky and studied the ravens circling. They were his minions, his carrier birds. Was this his work, or was it one of the other gods? Perhaps Mars? What were they playing at? Most of the divine were capricious in the best of times, and brutally vicious the rest. Decimus had learned this the hard way, at the cost of everything he loved. Hear that? Opto Marcus Espius asked, coming up behind Decimus. Mars calls to us. His thunder means our victory. Today, we water the soil with heathen blood. Find your silence, Optio. Decimus rebuked. Glancing across the ranks at the senior officers, sitting on their mounts, Still, he nodded, a slight dipping of the transverse crest of crimson feathers bristling atop his steel helmet. If the tribune or worse, the prefect, heard Marcus talking, he would be flogged for sure. Good that he does, old friend, Decimus said, just loud enough to be heard over the legion marching. It is a boon to us all that he accepted our offerings. 
but look at your sword and your brothers and leave the gods to their petty games. Mars won't be here to fight the savages with you. Yes, sir. A slightly chastened Marcus fell silent. But an amused quirk played on his mouth as he retreated to his position at the rear of the sentry. Silence was a virtue drilled into every Roman soldier from their first day in the yards. Royal recruits quickly learned that a flogging was the least a man could expect for breaking a legion discipline. The only sounds permitted by a legionary in formation were the screams of his dying enemies. Again, the distant rumble of thunder came, and the rhythmic pounding of 10,000 boots marching in time mingled with it greeted it like an old friend. Decimus lifted a hand to gently touch the lightning bolt engraved in his helmet's forehead just below the centurion's crest and made the sign of Jupiter. Something was wrong, he could feel it in his bones, but what? Pray, hear me mighty Jupiter, and send us victory, Decimus said in a muttered prayer to the heavens. Though he held little faith in the gods these days, why should he after what they had done? Still, what could it hurt? The gods answered. Voices in the distance barked orders, and Decimus pushed all thoughts of thunder and gods out of his mind as a signal at the front of the legion called them to a halt. Decimus brought his sentry to a stop in perfect harmony with the rest of his cohort, and, in turn, the machine that was the legion, an abrupt cessation of heavy boots drumming the hard turf. A second signal ordered the cohorts to stand ready, and the legion spread out in a near mile wide checkered formation of shields and glinting steel, prepared to meet the enemy should they charge. Quiet settled around them, and the two armies faced each other across a stretch of grass, no wider than twenty grain wagons sitting abreast. Decimus could not see much from his cohort's position of honour at the rear. The place for the most experienced and battle-hardened legionaries in the night. But he could make out a few details, and his experience filled in the rest. Should the lines falter, the first would surge forth and, like a great whirlwind of steel and death, leave their enemies as feasts for the circling ravens. Tiny figures of barbarians, arrayed in a motley assortment of weapons and armour, under animal skins, shook spears or swords in the air, thousands of snarling faces painted and bearded spitting crude obscenities that never made it to his ears. They were a riot of undisciplined rage and barely contained violence dressed in the flesh of men. The night was absolute silence, the kind found only in the hush before the fall of a headsman's blade. They were an army of spears honed on the bones of their enemies over long years and untold battles until their edges gleamed with the deadly sharpness of men who'd seen and done terrible things in service to Rome. And would so again. Some enemies found this silence unsettling and lost their nerve before the battle was joined. Decimus had seen it before. Enemy commanders who yielded the field without a single word swung. Perhaps these Caledonian barbarians would have the grace to quit the field before they were slaughtered and take a knee before Legatus Antonius Teverus. Wouldn't that be nice? Then the ninth could put this bleak frontier of cold and wind behind them and return to the relative warmth and safety of civilization waiting in the fortress of Hadrian's Wall. Abruptly, the ground under Decimus's boot heaved upward and gave a violent shudder, taking him out of his thoughts. By Jupiter's cough, what was that? A strange prickling filled the air, raising the little hairs on his arms. Again, the earth heaved, and a shrill keening rose in his ears. Dark sorcery. Lightning stabbed down out of the blue, scorching a broad swath of grass to smouldering black in the centre of the field between the two armies, and the immediate thunderclap rocked the sky. A second fork of pure, Dazzling white lanced the ground, then a third, a fourth. Rapid flashes of blinding brilliance stabbed as fast as a man could clap. The thunder that followed was so immense, Decimus was sure the earth had split asunder, opening the mortal world to the horrors of Tartarus. Again, 
thunder crashed and the earth thrashed beneath him like a living thing in agony. Chaos reigned within the legion's ranks, men in steel armour thrown into disarray, shouting and calling to know what was happening, half trying to pick themselves up off the ground while the rest fought to keep their feet. When he looked, the barbarian army was scattered and milling uncertainly, some throwing down their weapons and fleeing in terror. So this was not their doing. Then who? The gods? But why? A brilliant fork of jagged, arching silver seared Decimus's eyes. It cracked down from the sky and suffused the air around him with electric needles. Time seemed to stretch out. He opened his mouth to shout an order and the world exploded into dazzling white sparks, coupled with a sudden roaring in his ears as he was lifted off his feet. The wind howled around him, shrieking and blowing amid the screams of soldiers and the sounds of trees wrenched from the earth. A sudden impact with the ground drove the air from his lungs and left him stunned and listless in white blindness. Thunder, screams, and men dying became his world. It encompassed him. The wind was the wrath of the gods. Then it was over as quickly as it had begun. The wind died, and the earth steeled to silence. The air reeked of singed hair, burnt flesh, and ozone. Confusion. Ozone? Ringing in his ears. Decimus opened his eyes, and the world reeled in double images. The night lay sprawled in groaning tangles of steel, some only just stirring, others contorted and twisted, unnaturally steel with wisps of smoke rising from their armour. Decimus squeezed his eyes shut against the dizzying rush of images that assaulted him, dissolving and resolving in blurred fractures of themselves. All that remained of the ninth legion of Legio Eterna Vetrix was Decimus's cohort. The other 4,000 soldiers were nowhere in sight. Why had Mars struck at them? What had they done to anger him? Had their sacrifices displeased him in some way? Why? He silently shouted to the heavens. No answers came. In the end, he decided it didn't matter. The gods were petty and cruel, pitting their mortal children against each other in rancorous games designed to entertain the immortals. He knew this for true. Well, piss on that and whatever depraved games they played. All that mattered now was survival, and he meant to see the golden fields of Elysium on his own terms. Instinct took hold, and he was barking orders to reform the lines and ready for battle against the barbarians, who were surely charging. Men moved as one to obey. His vision cleared. Decimus saw no ravening horde howling down upon them. Indeed, he and his cohort were no longer in the valley of the Caledoni, but a strange place of thin violet grass and rolling hills, a vast alien vista where two pale blue moons hung in the sky above a brooding mountain range, rearing in the far distance. What trickery is this? Curse the gods for cruel... Had they banished the ninth to some unknown abyss? Behind us! A voice shouted, and Decimus whirled. A short distance away, a small army, unlike anything in his experience, stood regarding them in open shock. What he could see at this range, though, their open-faced helmets was lean and well-made, chiseled with precision from blocks of pure alabaster by the hand of a master artist. Their armour was just as exotic, shimmering shirts of finely crafted steel enamelled in a dozen colours. Radiant they were and indescribably delicate, yet somehow exuded strength, and they were very clearly not human. To the front, another voice called, and when he looked, Decimus saw a second, much larger force so different from the first that he had to rub his eyes and blink. What the gods had gifted the others in nearly limitless bounty, they had utterly denied these hideous creatures. Ugly, brutish faces, stamped with crude features, stared out of dull black iron helmets. They were of a height of Decimus, but broader and heavier, 
and wore plate armour with wicked spikes at the shoulders and elbows. Mars be merciful. What manner of creatures had descended on the ninth? This was not a primal abyss or some dark part of Elysium. This was the depths of Tartarus, and the demon hordes were upon them. Maniples form wall defence, he shouted, and voices relayed the order across the cohort. Nearly 1,000 men wheeled and marched into position until they formed a hollow square 40 men across and six ranks deep, fronted on all sides by shields bristling with spears. In the centre of this formation stood men in light leather armour readying slings and sacks of stones, and there were a few archers who'd survived the lightning. Slingers and archers ready! Decimus's heart pounded in his ears as he studied the two armies. He knew nothing about this enemy, their quality of their steel or tactics, what simmered in their hearts. Then he decided it didn't matter. There would be a battle here in the next few minutes, and all things of flesh and blood died with a spear through their lungs, and these creatures would prove no exception. Still, he would let them bring the fight to him, test their mettle, see if there was a spine among them. Perhaps he would go to see his family in Elysium today. Perhaps not. Part of him longed for that moment with an almost perverse melancholy, ached to pull his wife close, to feel his face with the scent of her hair, and hold his children, his weak apart. The battle-scarred soldier in him bared his teeth and snarled a curse at the gods, refusing to die. Decimus studied the forces arrayed before him. Were they friends or foes? Either way, he dared not divide his cohort to engage each army separately. Their strength lay together. But which to fight first? Surely if he engaged one, the other would take advantage and tear into his rear ranks. A heartbeat later, one of the armies decided it for him. A dull keening sound erupted from the deep ranks of black armoured brutes, and with a shout like thunder, they charged. 